Number one, corn driving. I went to college in the 70s, so my story is a little older, but it's horribly creepy. During my freshman year, I decided to drive to my school rather than take a flight. I had an old beater car, but I was positive that it would be fine for making the trip. It would take me a couple days to get there, though. I figured that'd be a pleasant little trip before I started one of the most intimidating moments of my life. It is not until you're driving across country that you realize how many cornfields there are out there. And at times, you can be driving through miles and miles of corn. It seems like it's never going to end. Anyone who has driven through that knows how hypnotic it can get after a while. And that didn't make it easy driving at night. At one point, at night, I drove by a couple of hitchhikers. I wondered how they had gotten so far away from civilization. I didn't pick them up though. I was never comfortable with the idea of picking up strangers, and I heard way too many stories about the unfortunate people who do, so I drove past them. Both guys started yelling obscenities at me for not stopping. I didn't worry about it though. It wasn't the first time I had been yelled at, and I would rather get yelled at than pick up the wrong people. I don't know how late it was when I was just super tired. I decided that I would pull over and get a little shut eye. This was a sort of normal thing to do really. I didn't even think I had passed by or seen a hotel for a long time. I don't know how long I had been asleep either when something woke me up. It was a little pinging sound, almost as if a pebble had hit my car. I looked around. The first thing that I noticed was that there was another car up ahead of me some ways. It was as if someone else had stopped for the night too. It was too far ahead for me to see if anyone was in it or not though. And that's when I heard a cracking sound. It was a small crack on my passenger side window. Again it was as if it was hit by a little rock. And of course I was really surprised by that. I looked around but didn't see anyone at first. But then there was another crack and I looked out into the corn. From there I could see two people barely hiding in the corn. And it was dark, but it looked like one of them had a slingshot. When they noticed that I noticed them, they came out of the corn pretty quickly. They came rushing out, and I could see that it was the two guys that I had passed up earlier. I had passed them up a while back, and there was no way they could have caught up with me by walking. All I can figure is that someone gave them a ride in that car ahead of me. I wanted to get away, so I turned on the ignition. Right then, one of the guys hit the passenger window with something that shattered it. They were yelling, remember us asshole? And other things at me. Fortunately, I had the car started, so I just took off while he was trying to break off the shattered glass of the window. I drove as fast as I could to get away. I was terrified and thought they would just catch up to me again, but where did they get that car? And if someone else had picked them up, why didn't I see anyone, a third person, either in the car or with them? I kept looking behind me, waiting to see another car behind me, and each time I did I just sped up. And eventually I did this and there was a police officer hiding in the dark and he pulled me over. I got a real fortunate break though. When those two guys drove past me, one of them threw something at my car. The stupidity of this was overwhelming, but I guess they didn't think the cop would go after them with me stopped. But oh, he did. Turns out I was right not to pick those two guys up. Someone did stop for them after me, and they robbed him and took his car. That is how they cut up to me. He wasn't killed or seriously injured, but still, to have someone rob you and steal from you when you're trying to be nice to them? That's absolutely terrible. I still got a ticket, but they went to jail. Number two, requests. I will begin this by telling you that as far as I know, none of the videos that were made in this story exist. I will also be posting it anonymously, so please don't ask to see them in the comments or anything like that. I will not reveal who I am in the comments. I needed money, and I think I'm reasonably good looking, so I thought I would start an OnlyFans account. 
A couple of my friends joked around that it might be a good idea, and the more I thought about it, I began agreeing with them. And of course, my channel was going to be sexual in nature, and I didn't want my friends seeing that, so I absolutely didn't tell them about it. Well, unfortunately, things did not go about how I would have liked with the account. I think everyone thinks that they're going to get instantly successful, and I have to tell you, that when you expect that and it doesn't happen, it's a real drag. That was what was going on for me, and it was terrible. I mean, I lived at home, so I didn't need to pay rent or anything like that. But I really badly wanted to move out and be on my own, so I really, really needed the money. But other than just a few individuals here and there, nothing caught on. I was considering just dropping the account when I got a message from someone. He told me that he thought I was really attractive and asked if I'd be willing to make some custom videos only for him. He was willing to pay me for them if I could do them and send them to him. Well, it's not really what I was looking for, but he offered me pretty good money to make these videos, all of which I did off of OnlyFans. And I'm so glad that I made that decision once I started making videos for the guy. I'm a pretty open-minded person when it comes to kinks. This guy certainly had the kinks, and he wasn't shy about telling me about them. Of course, this was because he wanted me to act some of those kinks out for him on camera. It started off pretty light, so I thought it would be easy. The first couple of videos I made for him were just me doing things in positions that he liked. It was nothing out of the ordinary, and he paid me for both of them. And then he sent me a request that I for sure thought couldn't be real. Even anonymously, I don't think that I would mention it. It was a humiliating and somewhat degrading task that he wanted me to perform for him. I thought it would be something outside of my boundaries, and I mentioned this to him. So in return, he offered me more money. Since I really wouldn't get harmed by what he requested, I finally decided to go ahead and do it. But things didn't stop there. He actually began asking me to simulate me harming myself in the videos. He even gave me instructions on how to use a knife and some fake blood to make it look like I was cutting myself. Again, this freaked me out as much as it would anyone. But I had already done some previous stuff and he was paying me very well. So I accepted and made the video. I won't go into any more detail about the videos, but it is plain to tell you that the request just got more and more bizarre and abstract, but some were simulations of self-harm. It came to be that I was getting more and more disturbed about what kind of person would be asking me to do things like that. I mean, there are some people into some really weird stuff out there. Like there are people who are into being eaten by others and I don't know what else. I mean, most of it disturbs me to even think about it. I was beginning to not like getting his emails because I knew what sort of thing was coming. Finally, after sending him so many of these videos, I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I was a bit afraid of the guy at that point, and I guess I was scared to tell him I didn't want to make his self-harm videos anymore because it was obvious he was unhinged in some way. Who knows what he would do if I stopped? I mean, crazy people have ways of finding you if they really want to. I hear YouTube stories all the time about things like that happening. Still, I sent him the email, and I nervously waited to hear back from him. It happened almost immediately, and the response was short and it made no sense. I can't stop. It chilled me because he wasn't telling me that I couldn't stop. He was telling me that he couldn't stop, yet I was the one making the videos. I asked him what he meant, and he just repeated that. It was the confusing and chilling answer right again, and he wouldn't say anything else. I thought about it, and all I could figure out is maybe he was hurting himself, like I was simulating in the videos, or maybe he just got off on it. But there was a real chance that this man was paying me money to make these videos and getting off on watching and hurting himself. I sent the guy an email telling him he needed to get help. I told him if he was harming himself he should go to the emergency room 
or call a hotline. I even gave him a number, but he never responded to me after that. He never explained what I can't stop meant, and I've wondered about it ever since. I don't know what to think about it. I mean, it could have all just been a fantasy. He just liked watching a weird kink. But it is scary that it might also have been real. And I have no idea what the man was doing or what he did. I just wanted to get that story off my chest. I've been dwelling on it for a long time. I hope sharing it will, at the very least, help me relax a little bit. Number 3. The Epiphany One Friday night in April of 1972, my brother Rick, Jerry, Mike, Tom, and I got together and went out to celebrate our upcoming graduation from high school. Rick and Jerry had another year, but Tom, Mike, and I were set to graduate in June. I bought three four-way hits of Red Barrel LSD from a friend who had already graduated the year before. He was selling it for two bucks a hit. All of us dropped it around six that night, but by eight nothing was happening. Figuring it for a dud, and half deciding what I was going to do to the guy who sold it to us, we drove over to the south side bottoms, the lower east side, to drown our sorrows and just walk along the railroad trestle that crossed the DM River there. Snowdrifts were still dotting the landscape even in April. It was almost about 32 degrees above zero, but the air seemed almost balmy. You could still smell the funk of the bottoms of the stagnant backwater and the diesel and creosote on the boards. We all knew to keep an eye and ear out for freighters, so it was no big deal when we climbed up on the massively riveted eye bar girders to the top of the trestle. There were still snow and drifts up there too, and the river water had little icebergs clearly visible rushing with the current. My brother Rick, Jerry, and I found a dry spot along the steel upper support beams about 30 feet above the tracks, which would have been 60 feet above the water. We hungered there, looking out for the river, waiting for the tripper's epiphany. Since we'd all dropped at the same time, it hit us all at the same time. One minute we're sitting on the highest part of the trestle, dangling our feet over the edge, tempting fate, and the next, it's the Loch Ness Monster for Christ's sake. I didn't see that. I saw Captain Kirk, Chief Science Officer Spock and Bones McCoy materialize across from us just above the water. Spock said there was no intelligent life here, so they disappeared. I assume they must have beamed back up to the SS Enterprise. Jerry didn't say anything. His Chester Cat grin and bleached out face said it all. He was clearly beyond his usual three sheets to the wind. We knew we were going to be watching out for him like a red-headed stepchild. Jerry was the youngest of a family of six, so every time we went out, I'd have to promise his dad that we'd bring him back alive. Usually whenever Jerry got that shit-faced, it was at the end of the night, so I knew right then this was going to be something else. Meanwhile, Tom and Mike started their mindfuck routines, doing cartwheels and handstands on the girders, clapping and jumping around like the flying Sanzini brothers. They were even hanging by their hands, 60 feet above the water, doing mock pull-ups. Yeah, 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 I thought. We've all done that before. But then Mike pushed it by doing a high wire act across the inner support brace, which was only about an inch wide. He made it across the first time, but on his return, he started acting like he was losing his balance. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Just then a northbound freighter came roaring across, its horned blazing its lights glaring, shaking the trestle like a tumbler, and puffing exhaust like a steel mill, and everything went weird. Both Mike and Tom disappeared. That's when we peeked. Rick and Jerry and I started to freak. 
We thought they had both fallen off somehow and were either bobbing ice corpses in the water or TV dinners on the tracks. Then Tom started yelling something about Mike in the water. The three of us flashed frozen to the upper girders were like catatonics on a break. What could we do? My brother Rick offered to jump off and swim to save Mike, but Tom started yelling again through the diesel smoke for us to look down. The train's long line of boxcars, tankers, and flat cars were still crossing the trestle. Somehow we spotted Mike. He dropped down into one of the moving boxcars and was already climbing down the ladder, running along the edge of the trestle and climbing halfway up to where we were on the girder, still grinning. Jerry came up for air just long enough to yell, Mike, you're a fuckhead asshole. I was just glad I didn't have to talk my brother out of attempting a water rescue. If he hadn't by some miracle drowned, he would have had an instant heart attack from the shock. The water temperature couldn't have been more than one degree above freezing. Shimmying up 45 degree supports to the upper spans of a railroad trestle at night, with no light, was tough enough when you're straight. But climbing down when you're peeking on LSD is a trip in itself, especially when you had to go down backward. At first Rick tried it frontward, but changed his mind when the 45 degree, 12 by 12 inch I-beam we were holding onto for dear life started to writhe like a giant snake. Quickly he abandoned that idea and contented himself like the rest of us, watching each other's asses scooch down the frigid I-beam until, after what felt like forever, we reached the tracks. You could still see the red lights of the caboose fading out further up. We walked on, jumping from tie to tie, taking care not to fall through the spaces, while sneaking peeks at the frigid and choppy water some thirty feet below. The river looked like the Niagara, just above the falls. We walked like the ground was still shaking all the way back to Mike's car. Mike, our DD designated driver, had the only car, a black and white 1966 Chevy Impala, four-door ragtop, on many a Friday night, or any night of the week for that matter, we would tool around town, crashing parties, going to concerts, running stoplights, scooping the loop, playing road hogs, or doing figure eights in the high school parking lot. Some nights we'd raid rival high school parties, arcades, or at home games, high as kites, tripping our nards off until everyone either finally passed out, gave up, went home, or the sun came up. Either way, we always made sure that everybody got home safe, totally polluted, but alive and well, and ready to raid another day. Mike and I were usually the last ones to call it a night. We'd stay up longer just before sunrise, driving out to the river, over to the reservoir, siphoning gas, stealing steaks, or smoking the last nightcap doobie while ruminating about what comes after high school. Vietnam was still raging, the moratoriums against the war, sometimes with thousands of attendees, blocked the loops, the main arterials, sometimes late into the night, the police, sheriff's department, fire department, even the National Guard and ambulance rescue units were everywhere. The demonstrations, assaults, sit-ins, shootings, and even bombings were happening off and on in the state and around the country back then. Day or night, it was like a war zone. Totally excellent for 16, 17, and 18-year-old post-adolescents. Tonight, however, was different. Instead of the usual gradual climb to peak, the highest you can get on LSD, after about one to two hours into a six or eight hour high, this peak started almost immediately like flicking a switch. Apart from the incredible hallucinations, the stomach pains almost made it unendurable. A big part of getting through the physical and mental stress of LSD is will. If you have the will, to enjoy it while it lasts, however long it seems to take, and 
without getting too psychologically tripped up by your drug or your friend's antics, you'll be alright. Some guys would get so out of it, like Jerry, they had to be helped and taken care of or watched. Which all of us did anyway, not just for him, but for each other. Another important part of the trip is who you're with. I dropped for the first time when I was 15 with my younger brother Rick, who was 14. We split a four-way hit of Green Dragon, LSD-25, which lasted about six hours. Because I was with my younger brother and we always looked out for one another, it was one of the best trips we ever had. We literally couldn't stop laughing. This, however, was turning out to be something else. We started off peaking after two hours of nothing, and then the part where you were seriously wasted lasted for eight hours straight. After the trussle, Mike drove us over to a local drugstore. We were back on the south side, our, our side of town, to buy beer. Or, if they wouldn't sell it because we were underage, steal it including cigarettes, tucking sometimes, two or three quart bottles of beer, and a couple of pack of cigarettes into our pea coats, huge black U.S. Navy surplus wool coats with the huge pockets. The wool was so heavy it was like wearing a bulletproof vest. With our biggest at 6 foot 2 inches and 180 pounds, nobody ever even approached us, let alone stopped us. Except, of course, some of our stupider high school rivals. And then it was either stand and deliver right here, right now, or time to rumble. First time I attended a rumble, I was 16. There were all these cars and all these guys, just most of them were high school dropouts, greasers, juicers, or ringers, lined up in the parking lot somewhere, their headlights on bright. Some had spotlights. Their horns blaring, looking like high school dropouts in their 20s or 30s, showing their ship by climbing on top of their cars or the flatbeds of their trucks and screaming their heads off, with challenges and obscenities about this guy's mother or that guy's father. They'd be throwing beer bottles, brandishing knives and chains, and doing everything they could to get the other side to either break or let out. After watching about five minutes of broken bottles, broken noses, and blood and vomit all over the place, Mike and I let out by going back to his car and driving the hell out of there. A year or so later, I went back with a friend to just watch and it had gotten so bad, the police were called and they ended up carrying some poor dumb fucks out on stretchers. Standing there, I was comparing the pain in my stomach to how I felt back then. When I realized, and for the first time ever, that I suddenly didn't know any of the guys, excluding my brother, of course, who we were with. Everyone was acting so weird, almost mechanical, that I was becoming genuinely freaked. Slowly I began to work Rick and me out of the store. We made it around the back without being seen. I remember standing in the snow, with the most incredible late rising moon coming up in the east. When I looked down, I saw the Jupiter landing scene from 2001, A Space Odyssey. The snow looked like an alien landscape with all the color and detail, casting bleached out elongated shadows on the, as the moon rose. Some time later, Tom and Mike finally found us. They were laughing. What the hell are you guys doing out here? Rick said, watching a movie. Jerry had been left in the car because he was, by then, a near-total basket case. From that point on, I only remembered bits and pieces of what happened. I remember Mike driving down streets with iridescent streetlights and blood-red stop signs, like in an animated cartoon. I remember driving down a brilliantly lit country road with the moon looking like the sun and having to come to a full stop because a black Angus steer was standing in the middle of the road and it wouldn't move and Rick and I, or even Jerry, thought it was the funniest thing we ever saw. But what was really funny was when Mike, our designated driver, donned his psychotic alter ego persona of Norman Bates. He loves Psycho. With his take on, Mother no, what have you done? 
and then doing a complete change up, rolling down his window like we were in an episode of Rawhide. Get off the road, little doggy. And then get off the road, you walking hamburger, or else I'm going to have to run you over with my car. And finally, lowing in this long, drawn out, Move, you latent porterhouse. Move, you closet sirloin. All of us were absolutely dying. When Mike was moving like a bovine, the rest of us got out, except for Jerry, of course, and tried to make the steer move because otherwise, in our best George raft, we were going to have to drive back to the drugstore, and it was the only store open that late, and steal some hamburger buns, ketchup, mustard, and pickles. Jerry liked pickles. The Black Angus must have taken the hint, because the next thing I remember We were doing figure eights in the parking lot across town at Hoover High. We went around and around and around and around until Mike threw up. Then Mike drove us back to the south side and over to the South Bridge Mall Theater, the only one open that late, where you could get in free after the ticket office closed. They were showing Gone with the Wind. Speaking of which, the DM Municipal Airport was a quarter mile west of the movie theater, on the far side of a four-lane road. The mall was across from one of the taxi runways. Still not believing that the people I was with were really my friends, and not a troop of alien replicas, I stayed back in the car. Rick decided to go in after all, and tried to sleep it off, which turned out to be impossible. I remember sprawling across the back seat, when a United Air started to land. It seemed like it was flying really low over the parking lot, and Mike's car is just roaring, its wake blasting. It couldn't have been more than 50 feet above the ground. It seemed to hover over the runway for some seconds, and then it exploded like the Hindenburg. The shock wave hitting the car. Instantly, I was sitting up in utter shock. When I looked out the back window, cars on the northbound side were slowly and being blown backward, as if driving into a strong headwind, while the southbound cars were being swept forward and up into a giant vortex. The weather system the explosion had created was streaked with blood reds, stark blacks, and blinding whites. It took the shape of a massive mushroom cloud. My conscious mind told me that it couldn't be real, but my subconscious mind told me the plane had just dropped a nuclear payload on the DM Municipal Airport. I fell back into the seat of Mike's car in the parking lot of the South Bridge Mall and watched the end of the world, and I wept. I saw cars being flung like toys in a tornado. I saw people walking along the sidewalks and parking lot trying to get back to their cars and being incinerated where they stood. I saw a credit union bank brick blown off, leaving the frame and then it was too blown away, leaving nothing. And then I saw a searing white light with the accompanying acoustics of a 10-ton nuclear blast ripping the air like the sound of tearing fabrics in a wind tunnel. And all of it came from the interior of Mike's 1966 Chevy Impala. Exhausted, I fell back, thinking, dreaming, terrified of what had just happened, and how I somehow wasn't dead, or, or was I? I remember looking out the windows and, and all around the car to see if there was anything left, not even parts of the parking lot, but there was nothing. Everything was gone. There were no stores, no buildings, no bank, no roads, and no airport. I looked down, pressing my face hard against the window, trying to make out if the car was even on land, but there was nothing except stars all around. It was as though I was suspended in time and space, but everything else was simply not there. How was it, I thought, I was still here? I must have passed out finally because I remember seeing what looked like a man from very far away. As he got closer, or I got closer to him, I noticed he was middle-aged, balding, 
and had a face that was old, weather-worn, and exceedingly fat. When my perspective changed, I was able to see that he was sitting on a stool, completely naked, with roll upon roll of fat covering his entire face and body. He seemed to be sweltering in the heat because between the fat were beads of sweat that would coalesce and co-mingle into streams and rivulets and roll down his face, across his great gut, and onto what I presumed to be the floor, though I couldn't see one beneath him. Strangely, he had unblinking blue eyes and was looking directly at me, searching my face. Finally, his countenance softened, and he started to laugh. It started as a kind of chuckle, and then a mighty guffaw, and then into full-out belly laugh. He laughed so hard snot was pouring down his face, mixing with the sweat pouring off him in sheets. I remember thinking, it's the laughing Buddha. Laughing even harder, he started choking, and then I started laughing too. I laughed so hard I laughed myself awake. When I came to, there was a complete silence. When I finally convinced myself to open my eyes, everything was back. There were no people, but everything. The buildings, the parking lot, the airport. Everything was back. It took me a while to get up the nerve to open the door. However, I thought that if I opened it, the rarefied air inside Mike's car would be displaced and I would dissolve into nothingness, like the people on the sidewalk. When I finally did open the door, the rush of the cold night air was so intense, I felt for a split second that I had dissolved into nothingness. Then I heard that sound again, laughing. Shakily, I crossed the Southbridge parking lot. I remember the smells, the freshness of the snow, the cold early morning air, my own scent. Smells are extremely poignant when you trip, and how it felt like the air was alive and circulating through my lungs and into the rest of me, invigorating me, freshening me. The patches of snow, the stark moon, the star-filled sky, all of it, felt new, like I had kind of been reborn. I celebrated the crunching ice and snow under my feet by skipping as I stumbled stealthily past the ticket office marquee and into the movie theater. As I pushed through the open doors, there were still no people anywhere, and I began to wonder if I was the last man on earth. I marveled at the movie poster, Gone with the Wind, and thought, the irony. When I got to the cinema hall, I remember peering in through the already open door, taking in all the sights and sounds looking for my brother and my friends, stopping momentarily to watch the scene where Clark Gable finally told Vivian Lee, quite frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a damn. Then I saw Tom, Mike, Jerry, and my brother Rick all staring at me. Tom and Mike still looked strange, but Jerry and Rick looked exactly how I felt. I knew what they, we, had gone through, helplessly plumbing the depths of our innermost subconscious. For now I thought I would sit down next to my brother and presumably my best friend Tom and reassure them that I was all right and let Tom in on a little secret about what I, we, had gone through. It was about 3.30 in the morning then. Mechanically Tom interrupted me and started off asking me how I felt and if I was all right which was strange because I assumed he had been tripping too, and besides, wasn't I usually the one asking those kind of questions anyway? So I interrupted back and asked Tom how he felt, and if he was alright when, from the look on his face, it suddenly occurred to me, another epiphany, that he and Mike hadn't dropped that night, and that's why they were acting so weird. They'd gotten themselves off on our community herb and stolen beer while torturing their best friends but they hadn't taken any acid. I thought of the usual cliches like vengeance is mine and karma's a bitch and what goes around comes around. After Mike drove everybody else home, Jerry and I stood outside his house, smoking a final doobie and finally realized that we were both completely straight. I remember turning to him and saying the most 
cogently coherent thing I'd said the entire night. You know, Jerry, it took 13 years to graduate high school, but it felt like a lifetime getting through the last eight hours. By the next afternoon, we found out that the guy who sold me the LSD had also sold it to two other kids. They both died from strychnine poisoning. If Rick, Jerry, and I had nine lives when we started out last night, we had eight left this morning. The guy sold us LSD laced with rat poison. Later I heard that he'd been arrested and charged with second degree murder. I never learned the whole story about what happened to him because after graduation I quit everything. And about a year later got married and had a son. But that's another story entirely. Hey y'all, Kill the Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Kill the Orange Cat, please feel free to click the subscribe button and bell below, or click the icon of Ichigo the Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment and share this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Kill the Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.